Oh, that's real nice. SpongeBob SquarePants has become one of the most iconic shows in history. If you're watching this video, you probably grew up on it. You've probably seen and used these memes. But underneath the more mainstream formats is something darker and more horrific. What exactly do these say about us and our society as a whole? That's what we're going to be exploring in this video. And by the end of this, I guarantee you'll never see SpongeBob quite the same as you once did. This show has always been a comfort for me. I have so many memories associated with this cartoon. One of my earliest is at this beach here where my parents used to take me to. I had a Spongebob ball that I would kick around. I didn't know about anything else going on in the world. I didn't have anything worth stressing over. I didn't even know what taxes were. So in these moments here, I was happy. And so, with all of these good memories and more, I was absolutely shocked when I, as a little kid, first saw this picture. This is Spongebob, an unholy grotesque version of our beloved sponge. The first time this name was given to this creature was in a deviant art post in late 2006, but this was by far not their first appearance. A month prior to this post, on a still relatively new platform called YouTube, a video titled Spongebob- Oh. Of course, only after I do my research for this that YouTube decides to take this video down 18 years after it was posted. This video was old enough to vote. In my original script, I even mentioned how I couldn't believe this video was still up. But fortunately for us, we have the Wayback Machine. Just a heads up, there is a jump scare that happens a bit after the start, so feel free to lower your volume if you want. Are you ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain! I can't hear you! Aye. Oh, who lives in a pineapple under the sea? SpongeBob SquarePants! Absorbent and yellow and porous is he? SpongeBob SquarePants! If nautical nonsense be something you wish, SpongeBob SquarePants! Then drop on the deck and flop like a fish! <laughs> so, to recap, the video opens with a hand mouth lip syncing with Painty the Pirate as the show's intro plays. Then, for some reason, there's a picture of two obese kids as the children's chorus responds to Painty. We go back to the hand mouth and then back to the chorus, with a picture of Bill Maher dressed up as an impaled Steve Irwin for Halloween, a month after Irwin's death. I genuinely don't know what to say about this right now, so... As the video continues, there are some seemingly harmless and normal drawings of Spongebob when the kids say his name. One of them being a picture that looks like it was taken from the show, given how on model it appears. But after the line, then drop on the deck and flop like a fish, we get a terrifying close-up. The screen goes black, for a single frame, this Tom DeLay face is shown. At the time, it was a popular face that would be used online to show disappointment or disapproval. Afterwards, this picture fades in and is altered as the show's theme song plays in reverse. Crew drawings after crew drawings are showed until the last remaining semblance of childhood is ripped away and the video gets more intense. As more drawings are shown, the audio repeatedly changes. Of course, this is merely a compilation of these sorts of images. They originated from 4chan's B-board, which was their sort of random content space. That means that, basically, anything that isn't illegal was allowed to be posted there. And these images grew in popularity. So much so that one of these actually found its way into an official Nickelodeon-backed SpongeBob SquarePants product. The 2009 Flash game, Tidy Whitey Tumble, was made to celebrate the show's 10 year anniversary. It's a pretty standard online game, but hidden in its files is this image of Spongebob, or rather, Spongebob. It's not used at all in the final version, so it was probably just placeholder art, but still, it's technically in the game. Once again, an official Spongebob game. That's how large this meme's reach has been. In fact, that reach goes even further because this is actually the second time within a month I brought up this exact Spongebob instance. But anyway, as these types of images became more popular, they'd be the focus of more videos that rake in hundreds of thousands of views, which for the time would have been astronomical. People would also try to branch out of the compilation trend and create something new. Take for example, Journey of Spongebob, an original abstract video that could fit right in at any contemporary art museum. And then, near the turn of the decade, fans made Spongebob take part in... This guy had a Pokemon! I swallowed my spaghetti! Oh. 
YouTube poops. They were loud, funny hear one of my secrets? No! raunchy, and sometimes creepy edits of scenes from the show. Because of the randomness element, you never quite knew what was gonna happen next. It could be an innocent joke. <laughs> Or maybe something that would never be in the original show for obvious reasons. That might not seem so bad, but there are more graphic and violent examples out there that I definitely can't show you without YouTube getting mad at me. So what does this all mean exactly? Why did Spongebob and Spongebob Y2Ps become so popular? At this point in time, lots of kids who were growing up on early Spongebob were getting into their teen years. Quite frankly, the answer is simple. They wanted to be rebellious. They wanted to be edgy. They were getting older and felt like they wanted. No, they needed to reject childish things like this show. Here was something that's brought so many good memories to these viewers, but in their angst, they felt a need to twist it, to grotesque it. The show itself regularly uses what are called gross-ups, where a highly detailed still image is shown for effect. That's where the idea behind Spongebob came from. Except, because these fans were getting older, they needed to push the boundaries of these gross-ups far past anything that could be shown on children's television. This and YTPs were a form of self-expression, a visual representation of childhood receding. But there's something else here that was happening, a more extreme version of what I just talked about. At the time, we got our very first In early April of 2010, a story was posted on 7chance X board, which is where the site held its creepy and spooky content. The story was titled Squidward's... I can't say the rest of this word or else YouTube will get mad at me, but it starts with S and ends inside. A later story adapted this and gave the creepypasta the alternate name of Red Mist. According to the original author, they recounted an unnerving experience they had back in 2005 when they worked as an intern at Nickelodeon. According to them, there was an explanation for why Spongebob's fourth season took so long to release. Something happened that led to both an investigation and the show being pushed behind schedule for months. Since they were an intern, they got to see episodes early as they were involved in the production cycle. One day, they and a couple of others were in the editing room to watch what they thought was a copy of the episode Fear of a Crappy Patty. But as the title card shows up, this is what they see. As odd as that may be for us, they rationalized it in the moment and didn't think much of it. This is because since it's not the final product, the animators would put up other title cards as a joke. For example, the episode where Spongebob and Patrick adopt a scallop, Rockabye Bivalve, had the internal title card, How Sex Doesn't Work. The episode revolves around Squidward's big performance at a concert. But as you can expect, he ends up disappointing the crowd, so they harshly boo him, with all of them having these hyper-realistic eyes. And in the crowd, also booing, is Spongebob. You don't need to be an avid watcher of the show to know that this is very out of character for him. It was the last straw for Squidward. Back at home, he's depressed and humiliated. While he's intensely sobbing, there's a growing forest breeze and a deep laughter in the background. As the screen twitches and blurs, something shows up for a single frame. They rewind to see what it was and they are shocked by what they find. It's a photograph of a child's mangled body with their intestines laying out. Besides them, there's the photographer's shadow. No one in the room knew what to make of this, so as they were desperate for a rational explanation, they assumed it was a sick joke and continued the video. Squidward was still crying as realistic blood trickled down his face, all while the background noises intensified. Another still image was shown and when they went back to see it, it was a photo of a different child that had met the same fate as the other. Upon seeing this one, the author had to choke back vomit while someone else ran out of the room. They once again resumed the video. The whole thing is silent now as Squidward puts his tentacles down to reveal his bloodshot eyes. He just stares forward at the viewer for a whole solid 10 seconds. Afterwards, he starts crying more and more fiercely as it becomes mixed with his screams and the returning background noises. Once again, there's a still photograph that appears for a moment, but this time, it's over 5 frames. It's a different child. As they play through it, they realize that the frames are slightly different. They play out like a gif of a man pulling out intestines. The story's author at this point lost it and threw up all over the floor. The sound editor called it there and stopped to call the show's creator, Steven Hillenburg, to take a look at what's going on. Once he arrives, 
They continue watching. Squidward is silent again as he stares, but then the camera pulls back to reveal that he's holding a shotgun. A deep voice speaks. Do it. Without hesitation, he puts the barrel in his mouth and... The aftermath is animated in a realistic manner and the final five seconds are just of his lifeless body on the bed. Hillenburg was livid and demanded to know who was responsible for this. Only the post author and a few others stayed behind in the room to rewatch the whole thing with Hillenburg. They had no answers on who edited the episode, but they were sure it was intercepted after the animation studio sent it over to them. Nickelodeon's own chief technology officer was called in to figure out what happened. They checked all the equipment involved to make sure nothing was compromised, but everything was fine. Police were also brought in due to the photos that were included, but nothing came out of that either. No child was ever identified. To this day, no one knows how exactly this happened or what it all meant as the company swept the entire incident under the rug. Now, this story is obviously false, but I was a kid when I first read this on my phone at like 3 a.m. at night. So for a time, I believed it, and it wasn't like how I just showed it to you. It was just a wall of text, and I'll always remember when I finished it. I scrolled down one last time, and the very last thing on the page was this picture, and I threw my phone across the bed. For further context, I had unrestricted and unsupervised internet access growing up. I've seen stuff. That's probably why I'm now so desensitized to anything horror related, as I have a hard time getting spooked by, well, anything. But despite all of that, this picture of Squidward, it scares me. Or rather, it did. I looked at it so much while making this video that I feel nothing towards it anymore, so yay? But for all those years, I couldn't even think of this. Looking back at it, it makes sense considering that as a really young kid, I would turn away every time the Hashling Slasher was on the TV. Maybe Red Eyes always just got to me for some reason. Eventually, this picture would be around for so long that it would succumb to internet humor as it resurfaced in popularity later, but this time, it was slapped with texts like, Don't ask who Joe is, as in, Joe Mama. Honestly, seeing this version was the first instance of me not taking this image seriously. As you saw earlier, fans over the years have been inspired to make their own versions of this story. I'm a fan of one in particular by YouTuber Vibing Leaf, titled Red Mist Retake. Although it does reference the children at the end of the video, the rest sort of follows the same general beats as the episode in the original Red Miss Creepypasta. In that version, the miss is personified as a physical danger. It's what's taking over and what overwhelms Squidward when he's at his lowest. And after he does what he does, we hear... There are a few interpretations out there of what the mist represents, with the most popular being a depiction of depression as its strength directly correlates to Squidward's emotional state. There's more that happens afterwards, but we'll talk about that later. The original story's reach has gotten so large that, years afterwards, it would even get the attention of Nickelodeon themselves. In 2019, an episode named Spongebob in Random Land would air. The basic premise is that he and Squidward take a delivery to Random Land, a place that defies all forms of logic. While there, Squidward opens a bunch of doors that lead to alternate realities of himself. One of them being... Although it's much tamer than the original image, it was apparently too much for the UK audience as the episode aired a different version over there. However, the US would also begin airing this alternate version going forward, even in the season's DVD set. Fortunately, the original scene was kept for all streaming services. According to a member of the Spongebob crew, this change was due to standards and practices deeming the reference too much for kids' television. But that didn't stop them from allegedly sneaking another reference the following year. At the start of season 13's A Place for Pets, Squidward gets two red soda cups stuck in his eyes. He then faces forward for a moment in a very familiar way. As I mentioned earlier, a reason why stuff like this gets popular is because the original audience that watched as children was getting older. The original author of the main creepypasta themselves even cited this as a reason for why they wrote that story. I was hoping to use the feelings of the people who grew up watching it against them. 
taking something familiar and safe and making it not so much. I figured by now a lot of kids grew up watching Spongebob, aired in 99, wrote this in 2010, and would be the ones viewing the Chan boards. I figured those who grew up on it would be more likely to be interested with something familiar. That's why these kinds of things are so effective. Why an image like this was able to stay with me and many others long after seeing it. I don't think it would have been as effective if it didn't have this character and if it were 100% original. Another example would be this picture from the Creepypasta, the bootleg episode, which revolves around a found copy of the episode Dumped. But in it, there's a lot of distorted images alongside blank screens, but at a certain moment, there's this scene with Spongebob's face. Bloodshot eyes, no mouth. As the story goes, if you stare at it long enough, it'll blink. In the story, the lives of the five teenagers who discovered it were forever changed for the worst. Altered images like these take visuals that we're used to seeing and force those feelings of comfort out the door. Something similar I want to mention here is the Bikini Bottom Horror webcomic by artists still in the simulation. Although it's not a creepypasta, it does deserve to be talked about here for a bit. The first page exploded in popularity in 2019 when it was originally posted to the I'm Sorry John subreddit, which is basically monster horror, eldritch horror, Garfield. If you want to learn more about that specifically, I highly recommend you check out Super Eye Patch Wolf's What the Internet Did to Garfield. It goes much more in depth into this specific genre of horror and it actually partially inspired this very video. But anyway, this comic explores an alternate version of the show as we know it. One where Patrick becomes a terror after realizing that the Krabby Patty secret formula was actually made out of starfish meat. Mr. Krabs had taken a part of Patrick, which grew out to be its own starfish, and held it captive for profit. As you can tell, the visuals get very disturbing, at least compared to how these characters are usually portrayed. The whole thing itself is worth a read as it takes some interesting turns, but when doing research for this video, I realized something. This right here is a sort of evolution of Spongebob. Instead of it being an edgy, in-your-face kind of crudeness, the visual horror is more controlled. The grotesqueness of our beloved characters serves a purpose. Here, it's attached to a deep narrative, one revolving around the will to persevere and survive. The creator never thought it'd get to this point. It was just supposed to be a single page comic, made for a non-Garfield weekend. But it piqued people's interest. They wanted more. At this point, those original Spongebob child viewers were now full-fledged grown-ups. Perhaps they were so interested in this depiction because for the past decade, they were still used to seeing Spongebob even if they haven't caught an episode in a long time. Throughout the 2010s, Spongebob memes started to rule the internet landscape. Familiar faces representing familiar situations. You really couldn't go anywhere online without stumbling on one of these. So it makes sense that internet users wanted to see something different from these characters. But around the same time as this comic, towards the end of the decade, that sense of wanting to see something different from this medium took an even darker turn. Closer. I just gotta act natural. Oh, that's real nice. This scene comes from the season 3 episode The Bully, where SpongeBob is trying to hide from flats in a toilet when he hears someone come in. It's quite literally a toilet joke. However, ever since this first aired in 2001, this screenshot right here has taken on a whole new meaning. A little under 20 years later, it would be altered with this text. Oh, that's a severed head. There is a severed head in a toilet in the restroom at Applebee's at 9364 WI16 on Alaska, Wisconsin. If we go over to that specific Applebee's Google Maps page, you could see that the top two things most talked about in reviews are a head and a toilet. Some of them even have responses from Applebee's apologizing and wanting to make their next visit a 5 star experience. Even for reviews that say the food and staff were amazing, it was just the head in the toilet that got to them. There obviously was no severed head at Applebee's and there never was. Or at least I hope there never was. So no head? 
This picture was just a part of the murder coordinates trend, where people would use seemingly innocent pictures to tell others that there's a head or a corpse at this specific location. It's speculated that this was based on an incident that happened in the summer of 2020, when some teenagers were using the app Randonautica, which gives users random map coordinates to explore. Upon arriving at the spot, they ended up finding a suitcase that had a body stuffed into it. Once police got there, other human remains were discovered in a bag nearby. This was just a major coincidence that made headlines around the time and seemed to have given this particular meme format a big boost. As for this particular picture, you'd see it utilized as a good reaction image here and there in response to current events or online news to highlight the absurdity of the topic. However, it would also be used for other stuff. As this Twitter thread by WitchDrDB puts it, this one image has exposed me to numerous rabbit holes and the most morbid case of murder that I've heard about in years. That basically sums up my own experience with it too. In fact, this particular one, oh, that's a real burnt corpse. Half-Life 2's Corpse 01 MDL uses a real burnt human body face for the texture. This image partially inspired not just this video, but the two hour long creepy video game easter eggs video I mentioned earlier. Most others like this one are in the same vein, where they're used as a vehicle to let others know about something weird. Usually something morbidly interesting. Let's go through some of them together. There are those that reference odd true crime cases, such as, Oh, it's just the body of Elisa Lam inside the water tank at Cecil Hotel. And, oh, that's a Hello Kitty mermaid stuffed toy filled with the dismembered remains of a female. And, oh, that's the severed legs of a stillborn baby cut off without the mother's knowledge and shipped from the UK to the United States to study the effects of radiation on human tissue as a part of Project Sunshine. These are things that actually happened. Other similar types reference creepy mysteries, such as, oh, that's a surgically removed human heart. In December 2022, the surgically removed heart of an adult human male was discovered in a salt pile on the property of the Tennessee Department of Transportation. No further info has been released to this day. And, oh, that's half of a human brain. In January of 2000, a worker at a sewage treatment plant in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania discovered half of a human brain inside a catch basin. Authorities determined that it had not been there long and that it had not come from a hospital or research lab. No DNA match has been found. Again, real dark things that have happened that would get someone interested in looking this stuff up. Then there's the ones that just point out something odd or shocking, usually an online thing. These are pretty much self-explanatory and straight to the point, so let's get to the real juicy stuff. The conspiracies. Oh, that simulated sentient life with full emotional awareness. There are leaked confidential confid There are leaked confidential documents proving sentient simulated life with emotions, awareness, and thought being withheld in a computer terminal. Oh, that's a giant beast dragon in space. Google Sky censored a red dragon in the constellation Virgo. This beast is probably the beast from Revelations 12. What? Oh, that's a giant corpse. There is a 20 foot tall, still twitching corpse of an unknown humanoid species restrained half a kilometer deep beneath Apple's headquarters in Cupertino, California, performing the calculation work of 150 supercomputers. Who comes up with this stuff? Obviously, these are made up and can actually be debunked pretty easily. There's no ancient civilization of Kepler 442b, there's no leaks regarding life on the subsurface ocean on Jupiter's largest moon, and there isn't a buried Nephilim's location on Hillary Clinton's leaked email server. <laughs> Why would there be documents pertaining to the resurrection chamber of Gilgamesh, the location of his body, and the location of the buried Nephilim? Huh? A reminder that all of this started with a joke about seeing something in a public toilet. It's evolved to become a medium for morbid curiosity and that's why it's gotten so popular. Humans are naturally curious and stuff like this just itches that part of our brain that wants to know more. We're no longer children. We can deal with the grim hard truths, the dark realities out there. Or can we?
The world isn't the same as when we were kids, and it seems like the future is getting more and more bleak. Heck, even kids growing up today are feeling the same way. And I truly think there's nothing more reflective of that fact than this. This is Mr. Krabs' final hours. The dancing footage and audio is from the season 3 episode Clams, where they're celebrating finding Mr. Krabs' missing millionth dollar. This altered version has been around since before 2016, and as you saw, there's a big mood shift once the nuclear bombs go off. As the music dampens and destruction takes up the background, they're still dancing, even after their expressions change. One of them being a familiar face. After Mr. Krabs takes up most of the screen to laugh, SpongeBob and Squidward become silhouettes as the sun is blocked out, leaving them in darkness. Fast forward to 2021. Final hours from The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. That's yet another childhood element added to this. At around the same time, it would grow in popularity as it's accompanied by texts like the United States and the People's Republic of China will engage in a nuclear war which will cause the collapse of both superpowers on June 28, 2027. Don't worry though, there are lots of these similar ones with expired dates and we're still fine. Or well, not fine, just… you know what I mean. This format has taken an existential turn though as these were spread around. If you rearrange a deck of cards enough times, then statistically, it will eventually be in its original formation. Due to the fact that time is infinite, the same goes for the particles in your brain. There is a higher chance of your brain briefly forming in a void complete with memories of living than there is of you actually existing on Earth. The only thing you could be sure of is the existence of your own mind. If you are reading this, you are likely the only real consciousness to have ever existed in the entire universe. You are alone. Nothing is real. This theory is called the Boltzmann Brain. There's also the cosmic horrors of our place in the universe. We have been trying to contact otherworldly life for decades, sending out radio signals and satellites containing pieces of culture from around the world. Yet, we've hardly had anything that could even be considered a response. In nature, when a dangerous animal is in the area, other animals grow quiet as to not alert attention. What if life is more common than we thought, but they are hiding? They are laying low so as to avoid a malicious entity hiding in the cosmos. Yet here we are, crying out into the darkness, begging for attention. Perhaps we've stolen this entity's attention. Maybe it's on its way. Our universe could exist in a false vacuum. If this is true, an event that releases enough energy could hypothetically create a bubble of true vacuum, which would expand in all directions at the speed of light. If this bubble were to exist, we would have no way of knowing due to it moving at the speed of light. It would also obliterate anything it touches, as the bubble contains incredibly high amounts of energy and could rewrite the basic structure of matter itself. At any moment, you and everything else on this earth in this solar system could be destroyed. There is no way to predict this. There is no way to stop this. It's not even an inevitable fate you must accept, for it may not even be true. Savor every single moment you live, because it could be your last. As frightening as all of those notions are, they're just theories. Here's the one that actually gets to me, because we're seeing the effects of this as we speak. Plastic was invented in 1907, and in 115 years, humanity has doomed the planet with its pollution. There is now 8.3 billion tons of plastic on Earth, and it's estimated that 6.3 billion of that is trash. Plastic could break down into such small parts that it could enter your bloodstream, and even break the blood-brain barrier. In fact, a study was done to test the effect of microplastics on humans, and the scientists behind the study had to end it, stating that they could not find a control group. Man, we're so f***ed. <laughs> All of these are reflections on our general attitude towards not just ourselves, but also the future. We're older now, and we understand the true horrors of the world. We've taken these characters that we've grown up with and twisted them to reflect ourselves, using them in ways that their creator would have never done so himself. That's not to say it's necessarily disrespecting him or his legacy, no. 
In fact, I'm confident he'd understand. He looked out for us in ways you might not have realized. He was a dedicated marine biologist and wanted to help sustain the ocean for future generations. That's why, when he saw the first doll based on Spongebob, he was terrified. As he put it, My biggest nightmare is that I'm going to be at the beach one day and one of these dolls is going to wash up on the shore like garbage. He would end up with the exact opposite result of why he made the show in the first place. Instead of exposing children to these animals and teaching them a sense of respect towards the ocean and its inhabitants, his creation's branding would end up hurting the aquatic ecosystems he cared so much about. That's why he made sure he had a say in the merchandising of his creation. On top of that, he also did his best to keep the network from using fast food chains to promote the show. Unfortunately, Both of these things he was so worried about would happen. And in the grand scheme of things, stuff got worse. The effects of climate change and pollution are devastating to marine life. We've been seeing it happen in real time. That interview where he said he was afraid of seeing Spongebob merch out in the wild came from 2004. And those toys were made not long after Spongebob's popularity became valuable to the studio in the late 90s. 20 years later, as of 2019, the franchise had made over $13 billion in merchandising revenue alone. Not from commercials during episodes or movie ticket sales. No, $13 billion purely from physical merchandise. A billion is a big number. Too big for our minds to properly imagine, so here's putting it into perspective. Now multiply that by 13. As of this video, this data is 5 years behind. So who knows how much more money has been made since then. How much physical product has been created. That doll that Hillenberg mentioned he was so scared of? I owned it. It was my favorite. I slept with it every night. I admittedly didn't have an easy childhood, and I remember holding on to this whenever things got rough. Until I held on to it for the very last time, without knowing it would be the last time. I have no idea where this is now. Is it buried in a trash heap? Or has it become incinerated garbage? Or much to mine and Hillenberg's horror, is it out at sea, poisoning the very creatures it's based off of? I really wish I could ask him what he thinks of this and these memes in particular. What would he say to comfort us? His figurative children. We're tired. We're grown up and have seen too much already. It just sometimes feels like these issues weighing us down are so big, so daunting, that we can't do anything to change them for the better. So we cling on to what we know, that familiar comfort. We use these memes as a form of expression, to portray that feeling of hopelessness, of laughing through the pain. It's cathartic for both the creators of these memes and us, the viewers. And then we share them with others who we know also feel the same way, because we have all felt that helpless feeling. I remember the moment where I was watching Spongebob and I got hit with my first wave of existentialism out of nowhere when I realized, I'm gonna grow up and I'm going to die one day. I didn't know how to process that, so I just ignored it and kept watching TV, but it'd still be in the back of my mind here and there as the years went on. There's something else I have to show you about Mr. Krabs' final hours. Towards the end of the video, if you slow it down for a single frame, there's an image of some sort of Spongebob merchandise set ablaze. This is the personification of everything here. The corruption of childhood and how helpless we feel to all the negative stuff going on. Wars, climate change, pollution, financial instability, a volatile job market, all the other major etc. The world is burning and you could watch every single angle of it. That's not even considering life's normal hardships. It's not difficult to develop a sort of nihilism, to get numb to it all as a sort of self-defense mechanism so you could just go through the motions of life. Days become weeks, weeks become months, months become years. You were 16 yesterday, 26 today, and you'll be 37 tomorrow. Who knows how bad it'll be by then. Having to go through so many things, that increasing numbness just makes it all feel like... Nothing matters. When I first set out to make this video, I didn't think I'd get this deep into it. I honestly thought it was just going to be a sort of meme recap. 
You might have expected that too. But along the way, I found myself in more and more unexpected places. SpongeBob is everywhere in our online lives. We see him and others almost every day in so many different forms. We grew up with these characters. They're the most perfect, recognizable stand-ins for us and our situations. Good and bad. Like I mentioned in my first Spongebob video, this show is a shared experience. It's something that links all of us that grew up watching it. We're less alone than we feel, and that's something we need to be reminded of. I've gotten so many comments of all the positive ways this cartoon has impacted people's lives, especially through hard times. Despite everything, we're still going, and I'm so proud of each and every one of you for that. Just like how Bikini Bottom Horror's overarching story is about the will to persevere, no matter the overwhelming odds. Remember the Red Mist retake video I mentioned? That ends with Spongebob and Patrick. They reminisce about Squidward and how he's gone. As we see that same corruption from the mist start to visually take Spongebob too in his grief, it's Patrick's words and companionship that pulls him out of the mist's grasps. The story ends with them looking out at the horizon, in what is the brightest scene in the entire video. These are fan-made creations that acknowledge the simple fact that life isn't easy, but it's the only one we have. Our individual existence is a statistical impossibility, and yet, here we are. So we have to make the most of it. We didn't decide to be born, but we have to keep on living. No, that's not enough. We have to try to keep on thriving. As dark and depressing as these memes have mirrored our own lives, it's important to remember that it's not all bad. Fun facts with Swidward would say, before you were born, you saw, heard, and felt nothing. That could happen after you die too. This short lifetime could be your only and temporary escape from the void. Take care of yourself and each other. Spend time with your loved ones and with your passions. Enjoy those moments because you won't always be able to. Thanks for watching.